Welcome to the School of Travel's podcast. I'm your host, Becky Gillespie, and each week I bring you stories of how travel can truly change your life if you take the chance to get out on the road and step out of your comfort zone. My guests also share travel tips and lessons they've learned along the way, which I hope inspires you to let travel be your teacher. Welcome to episode 11 of the School of Travel's podcast. And this is going to be the first solo episode that I've done since the very first episode. So I hope that you're ready to sit back and listen to me for the next 30 minutes or so. But I think you will enjoy this day by day, well, it was only two days, but this account of me climbing Mount Kinabalu in Borneo, Malaysia. For anybody who's ever been interested in climbing a mountain before, or particularly Mount Kinabalu. First of all, let me explain Borneo a little bit. So Borneo is actually the third largest island in the world and the largest in Asia. And there are three different countries that claim part of Borneo. Malaysia, Brunei in the north, and then Indonesia to the south. And 73% of the island is Indonesian territory. In the north, you have East Malaysian states of Sabah and Sarawak, which is about 26% of the island, and Mount Kinabalu is in Sabah, Malaysia. So I actually flew in from Chiang Mai, Thailand, where I've been staying, and I first went to the capital of Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, to connect to Kota Kinabalu, which is the city where you're going to fly into to climb Mount Kinabalu. And both of the cities, Kuala Lumpur is a huge city. Uh, you could stay for a few days if you wanted to. If you wanted, if you've never been to Malaysia and you want to check out that part of Malaysia, but it's a completely separate landmass from Borneo where you need to go to climb this mountain. So there will be another flight involved. And interestingly, when you go to Borneo, even though you're still in Malaysia, when you go to Sabah, you are going to get your passport stamped again like you've just entered another country. It's pretty interesting. I kept having my passport stamped as I went to different parts of Borneo and then back to the peninsular Malaysia. So about Mount Kinabalu, uh, it was actually the very first UNESCO World Heritage Site in Malaysia, and it's the highest mountain in Malaysia at 4,095 meters. So you will be experiencing potential altitude sickness when you climb. I've heard that typically above 2,200 meters, that's when you'll start to have to be concerned about altitude and you'll feel like a shortness of breath, uh, potentially a headache or nausea. These are some of the symptoms of altitude sickness, which you can check online as well. Um, anytime you're preparing for a climb that's higher than 2,200 meters, as I said, you, you might want to be taking medication for altitude sickness, have it on you. Just be aware that it might be a factor, which could then mean that you won't be able to finish your climb if you feel the symptoms because when you climb mountains, you're always told if you feel altitude sickness symptoms, do not ignore them, take them seriously. And the best way to treat altitude sickness is to actually go back down the mountain. So much better to go back down than to push yourself through and think, oh, I'll get over this. I can make it to the summit. No, always go down. I decided to climb Mount Kinabalu. When I took this trip to Borneo, I went for one week I actually needed to leave Thailand because I would be soon going over the 30-day limit that you get um, as a U.S. citizen when you go to Thailand without a visa already in your passport. So it was kind of like a visa run for me because I was going back to Chiang Mai, but it also was a place I'd wanted to go. However, I will say, if you go to Borneo in the future, please give it at least two weeks. Borneo has a lot of things to see. There's a lot of wildlife nature hikes waterfalls there's all kinds of things to see and um, if you're also planning to climb mount kinabalu which is about it's going to take at least three days of your uh, vacation definitely plan for two weeks if you if you're especially if you're not staying anywhere near borneo if you're on the other side of the planet give it a minimum of two weeks so i had wanted to climb mount kinabalu before i arrived in Borneo. So I knew that I needed to bring warm clothes, even though I was coming from Thailand. I had like a thin down jacket, um, two other layers of jackets. I had a windbreaker that I brought with me. I have my trusty, if you've heard, if you've listened to me on the podcast before, you might have heard that I love to pack a head torch, like a head flashlight that almost every hiker I can imagine would pack that as something for their hike. 
especially Mount Kinabalu is an overnight, it's a two day, one night adventure typically. So you're going to be staying up near the top of the mountain and you're, you're going to do a late night hike so you get to the summit for sunrise. A head torch is required for the hike. And if you don't bring it with you on this hike to Mount Kinabalu, you can rent it at the Laban Rata hut, which I'll talk about later, near where you stay at the top of the mountain. These are just some things I brought with me. I also like to hike with a camel pack, uh, camelback, whatever they're called. Mine, mine is a different brand. I think it's called platypus. Uh, because I always find it easier to just suck out of a tube while, as I'm hiking instead of stopping, reaching around for my water bottle, you know, opening it, drinking, putting it back. And sometimes um, I've had backpacks where the water bottle just keeps falling out as I'm turning a corner or doing a weird maneuver going up a hill. So I've, all, I've used a carabiner to prevent that and like clipped my water bottle onto my bag. But I've now gotten used to having the camel backs, which, which are just easier to use in my opinion, except you do have to keep it clean and make sure you don't get mold, things like that. Definitely whenever you're planning on going on a hike, especially something that's going to be at a high altitude or is a multi-day hike, check the packing list that the tour operator will give you if you're going on a tour or just Google uh, the hike so that you have an idea as to what you need to be prepared because you know, it's always a more comfortable experience if you have the things with you. And you never know, depending on the country, what they're going to have for you to, to buy in the country or how easy it is to find. I actually had a, a great experience. I stayed at a hostel in Kota Kinabalu that was really close to a shopping mall. And the shopping mall had, they had a pharmacy where I bought, I actually bought altitude sickness. I bought something for nausea and something for a headache, and it was all less than like $5. So um, it actually was cheaper for me to prepare everything. In Malaysia, I gave myself a lot of time before going on the hike to make sure I, I could buy these things. That's another thing. It's hard when you don't give yourself a lot of time. So my story is that I flew into Kota Kinabalu, and I, I arrived at like 2 p.m. in the afternoon, I stayed at a lovely hostel called the Escape Backpackers KK Hostel in Kota Kinabalu, which I can totally recommend. It has a very lovely, homey feel, and they will help you with just about anything. They actually helped me find a great deal to go to the two-day, one-night trek for Mount Kinabalu, because a big problem, I think, for people that, were, that would be trying to do this is the price. It used to be a lot cheaper to climb Mount Kinabalu, but since the 2015 Saba earthquake, it got more expensive because a lot of huts and things were shut down after the earthquake, and there were 137 climbers that were stranded on the mountain at that time, and 18 deaths, and it was a big tragedy for the Mount Kinabalu area, and I think they're still recovering from that, and they've now... Only, I think they're now issuing only 135 climb permits per day issued by Saba Parks. So it can be difficult to get, to be able to go as an international person, especially if you have a big group of friends that want to go. It's hard to know if you can even get a permit very far in advance. So of those 135 climbing permits, I think only like 10% of them are issued to non-Malaysian people. So this is why the price is kind of high. I was first quoted 1990 Malaysian ringgit for my two-day, one-night tour, which in U.S. dollars is about $483. And I was thinking $500 for just one night and then climbing to the top of the mountain for sunrise is a lot of money. If you compare it to the cost of multi-day hikes in Nepal or even in Mount Kilimanjaro, I mean, you, you, pay, you pay a lot less per day for those treks. But because of the special situation in Malaysia and a tourism tax that they put on staying in the room and, um, and that the cost of the permit, the, the cost of the permit, if you check uh, mountkinabalu.com website, for an international person buying a permit, it's 200 ringgit. So, um, and then you have to pay porter fees if you want a porter. And the mountain guide per day is 230 uh, ringgit for an adult. So it's, uh, 
it's not I think it's hard to get anything cheaper than about probably a thousand ringgit at this point if you're lucky so I paid 1250 ringgit 300 US dollars through escape backpackers KK and they had I guess a contact that they sent a woman came to the hostel and I went to a coffee shop with her and she sat down with me uh, she explained to me all the things I would need to have for the following day and she explained how the trail works and what I could expect the next day so I want to thank Escape Backpackers KK for hooking me up with that I would recommend them there's a, a really lovely young owner of the hostel who's more than happy to help you so uh, I will put a link to their ho- hostel on my website theschooloftravels.com. That's how I set things up, was through my hostel, and I got lucky. They said about, I I contacted to ask if a certain day was available to climb about three days in advance, and they got back to me when I was traveling in a different part of Borneo, and they said, yep, that day will work. There is a permit. I was actually traveling alone, so I only did one, and they said that at the time there was one other person that would be coming, And, you know, at this point, I I think it's nicer to climb with other people. And I think it's also nice to climb with a guide. I believe that, um, I actually can't tell you if a guide is necessary or not, but I would definitely say having a guide with us on our trip was a lot better because he knew every, all the distances between every hut. He, like, we always, if we were feeling a bit tired or a bit, you know, at a loss of inspiration to keep going. He's like, oh, it's only 500 more meters to the next place, or it's only one kilometer more, or something like that. And we we knew that we could keep going. Um, and he gave us, you know, a lot of cultural information and important information that would have been hard for us to figure out on our own. So having a guide is good. A lot of times when you're climbing, you're not sure if you want one or not, but it's fine. The other great thing about the hike for Mount Kinabalu is that you don't need a porter. A lot of times there's this there's a, there's a thought about whether you should pay for a porter, whether that's even a good thing to do, make someone carry a heavy pack up a mountain for you because you can't. Um, but I always think it's great to take porters. You're supporting that person's livelihood and giving them an income in the country. But I will say that for Mount Kinabalu, I don't think paying for porters is necessary because it's a one-night hike and you don't need to pack very much for that. Of course, when you're climbing, the lighter you can have your pack, the better. You don't, I mean, you want almost nothing in that pack. You want the bare essentials because it will just feel like 10 times heavier as you start to climb up the mountain and you're getting so tired. So in the end, it ended up that I was paired with a German couple, Simone and Marius, who had never done a hike like this before. And I think they were in their mid-20s. And lovely people, you're going to hear them on my uh, recordings from the from the field, from the mountain itself. And uh, this other person they told me was coming, they must have changed their minds or taken a different trek because I never met them. So it was just me and this German couple, and we were placed with our guide, Andy. And uh, the first clip you're going to hear here is us in the bus on the way to the mountain. We were picked up at about 8 in the morning. And we, it's about a two-hour drive to the mountain from Kota Kinabalu itself. A little bit of windy roads. Um, our driver was really cruising fast. You get some great views of the mountain on the way up. They will stop you at, at the welcome center to sign you know, some release forms and things like that. Uh, and it's kind of the official place where you get your permit. That's where the driver will take you first. Uh, then you're going to be met by your guide. So actually just a driver picked us up and then our guide met us at the welcome center and we got to meet Andy. So the first clip you're going to hear is me talking in the bus with Simone and Marius. So we are now on our way to the foot of Mount Kinabalu where we're going to start our hike today. And it's me and a German couple, Simone and Marius, who I've just met. And they said they haven't really trained. They don't know what's going to happen today. I, I can't say that I know either, but we're going to have a good time today. It, so far, it's sunny. We don't want any rain. Really hoping we don't have any rain. Um, but I think we have another hour and a half till we get to the foot of this mountain. And let's see how it goes. By the way, the pop music here in Kota Kinabalu, just like home, just like America. 
So we arrived and we got to meet Andy, and now you're going to hear Andy explaining how the trail works. So after this, we drive to Timpohon Gate, yeah? So about 10, 15 minutes from here. Okay. Then, yeah, we start, we start hiking from here. Yeah, so today we have 6 kilometers. So in 5 to 6 hours, but depends how we... Uh, yeah. depends our pace yeah and then along the way we have seven stop point yeah seven shelter and then every stop point they have um, a rubbish bin water tank and then toilet and then put the water safe to drink but untreated water yeah so if you have um, water tablet that's uh, yeah, much better. Can we buy a bottle of water? Um, yeah. We can buy at the Laban Ratares house. Okay. Yeah. And then... But you can drink the water without the tablet. Um, yeah, can. Yeah. I, I, I drink too. Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, four kilometers here, our lunch point, yeah? yeah? So, now you have your back lunch. So, we try to have our lunch here. So, um, uh, uh, along the way, we have uh, a few junction. And then we just follow some trail, yeah? yeah some trail. And then you guys stay at Wamang Hostel. Mm -hmm. And then all your mail will be in Laban Ratari South, just beside. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then. Um, one more thing, um, uh, for your information, Mountain Kinabalu is a um, secret place for local people here, to, so we try to respect. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah, we not allowed to screaming, yelling, yeah. then no public nudity, yeah. yeah. And then, <laughs> Uh, and then no drone John, yeah? No yeah. drone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> then tomorrow morning um, we have 2.7 from here to peak and then uh, around two wake up having supper breakfast and then two thirty yeah we start hike. Two thirty in the morning? Yeah morning. <laughs> and then um, two point seven in three four hour. Yeah, three four hour. And then one kilometer from uh, hostel, one checkpoint. So you need to show you permit claim, yeah. Mm -hmm. So don't forget to bring tomorrow. So, yeah, any question? So, we come back the same way that we came? Um, yeah, we uh, come back in the same way. Um, yeah. Can we leave anything at La Banrata uh, Rest House to come uh, back and get it? Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So, tomorrow during um, summer trail, we just um, bring uh, in a photo, Okay, mm -hmm. enough warm ah, okay. yeah. Then the rest you can leave in your room. Ah, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Where, where do we get the, the permit card? Um, yeah. Later the driver will be, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, so, what happens if halfway on the way I can't go any further? Um, if I can't make it? <laughs> um, actually, uh, at um, uh, lunch point we have um, like a um, uh, house for who does cannot make it yeah. and then they want to try stay here yeah so yeah okay Can, yeah. and what happens if I get altitude sickness um if because um, I don't have any medicine for it um we'll see because we 
sometimes uh, people uh, get um, uh, yeah headache, yeah. dizzy, yeah. Sometimes they just um, normal. Okay. Yeah, but it getting worse. We need to bring them down. Yeah. yeah. And then actually we have um, a rescue team. Okay. Yeah. So okay. if anyone can uh, work going down, so the rescue team will be okay. yeah, carry. Okay. <laughs> yeah. When do we rent the gloves? I heard we can rent. Um, you can do at the Laban Ratares house. Okay. Uh, glove, uh, extra jacket, headlamp, yeah. You can do at the Laban Ratares house. Okay. Yeah. So, and how, what about tracking poles? Just curious. Is it can um, the sticks? You can rent here if you want. Yeah. So, but it's a lot of stairs, right? Um, yeah. Um, for your information, um, 90 percent um, stays. Yes. 90 percent. Yeah. So today. Today. Really today. 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 Yeah. Okay. Today. Okay. Yeah. Would and sticks be helpful or not? I mean, if it's stairs, they're not really that. Um, for me, um, uh, very helping when we start going down. Yeah, going down. Uh, really yeah. Going up, not use too much, but going down, we need. Yeah, because you need to, because you need to support the. Okay, to wear contact lenses on the peak. So yeah, the attitude is nothing. Can can. It, you can wear. Okay, yeah, can. Good. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's all my questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. For the moment. Yeah. Okay, that's all. So, as Andy was explaining, the way the hike works, if you're doing the two-day, one-night trek, is that you start at Timofon Gate, which is 1,866 meters, and is essentially zero, uh, the marker zero for the hike, and then you climb up, it's all up that first day. There's, <laughs> I was amazed by how very little flat or downhill there actually was um, and a lot of the the steps are actually built in like so it's metal stairs or wooden stairs a lot of railings and uh, you're you have to be ready for that I would say like there is not much of a a break for <laughs> finding that flat or finding the downhill so you pass a lot of huts along the way which are nice they do give you a break you can stop at every hut if you like and they're typically about 700 meters to 1.5 kilometers apart from each other and the first day we started about 10:30, and I think we finished at around 4:30, and we hiked from 1866 meters to 3,273 meters. So that's, you know, about, you're going about almost 2,000 meters up. And our issue is that we only got the first hour before it started raining. So the last five hours it was raining consistently the whole time. So every hut that we stopped at, we would take a break from the rain and just try to keep pushing ahead. I mean, I only had Nikes with me. I decided not to bring my big hiking boots uh, since last being at home in Ohio. So I thought I, it was my first time to hike in shoes that I felt like weren't quite as good as the, you know, as what you would normally use for hiking. But actually, one cool thing about the rocks that you're climbing up on this trail for Mount Kinabalu is that they're not slippery. I think they're granite. Um, some kind of granite is what Andy was saying. And it, it's funny because if it was limestone, you'd think it, everything's going to be slippery. But even that was pouring down rain, you could be you could be assured when you'd step that you weren't going to slip. But it was it was great. Also, I should mention hiking sticks are essential on this trek, especially if you do hit rain like we did. Um, I rented my hiking poles from the Timophone Gate area. I want to say it was 10 ringgit a pole. Very reasonable and definitely worth it. And I was relying on my sticks the whole time, especially coming down the next day. They were essential. So we got to Labanrata Rest House at about, as I said, 3,200 meters at about 4.30, I want to say. 
And actually, we were staying at the Lamang Hut, uh, just next door to La Badraza. La Mang Hut is the only hut that is owned by the government. So that's actually, it actually means less frills, but it's cheaper, I think, as the tour package to stay there. La Mang Hut has about 16 beds. The lady the day before was explaining, you've got to be ready for all manner of snoring and noise, and it's not going to be the best sleep, but it is cheaper. So... Um, definitely earplugs and an eye mask would be essential when you're dealing with sleeping with that many people. And it is very cold, even though it was Borneo in, in general is a hot and humid place at 3,200 meters, it's going to be cold. So there was a hot water kettle and there was a sink and a, sh and a couple of shower spaces, but the showers were not hot. So really, you shouldn't take a shower when you're up there. You're, you're freezing, and, it, and we were wet because it had been raining all day. So I remember we all surrounded this kettle, and we're just sticking our hands on the kettle and wishing that we'd brought hot water bottles, which is another thing I might recommend if, if you are going to stay up there for a night. Get a hot water bottle, get it all warm, put it in the sheets with you, and you'll stay warm. Actually, Simone used a plastic water bottle and just made the water a little bit cooler by mixing it with cold water, and she said it really helped her that night. And the Laban Rata rest house is actually the really nice one. It's the biggest hut up there. And that's where you'll go for your dinner, uh, which is it was wonderful. It was this beautiful buffet dinner. Uh, had a lot of different choices for food, and we paid for our drinks separately. But we got um, hot tea. They had coffee. It's also where you can rent gloves for going up, which I did. I think the gloves were five ringgit. And I also rented a hat for five ringgit, a woolly hat. And you can rent your, your head torch, as I mentioned earlier there. Also, you can rent a warm coat if you if you don't think your coat is warm enough. I thought I was okay with that, but it's an option. So Laban Rata is really the center of the Panalaban base camp area for doing the summit, the morning summit climb. So we had a great meal at La Banrata, but we, we knew that we were going to have to get up at one in the morning to start out and hike at two in the morning. This is what Andy had told us. So I'm going to stop here for just a moment and I'm going to play you a series of stops that we made at different huts all the way up the mountain. At the end, you're also going to hear a little tiny clip of what was the craziest snorer any of us in our group had ever heard. This guy was a local Malaysian. We're not sure if he was a guide or not that was sleeping in this Lamang hut, but when he would snore, he would breathe in, and then when he breathed out, he would. it sounded like he was upset at someone, he was moaning, he was suddenly wildly making unintelligible noise, and he did it every time. And it was a mix of being worried for him and being scared of him and being annoyed by him. It was just unbelievable. So poor Simone and Marius got one hour of sleep. Somehow I was able to sleep through it. I don't even know how this happened, but I went ahead and, and could sleep, but they did not sleep hardly at all. And then we had to wake up at one in the morning. But let me pause here and you'll now hear a series of clips from the climb up on day one. How many times have you climbed this mountain? Um, uh, we do two or three times a week, then almost five years now. Five years? Yeah, wow. almost. Are you asking me to do math? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's like roughly over 500 times. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> I don't have I'll do the exact map yeah. later. <laughs> <laughs> we're stopping at one of many huts along the way today. I think we're at like 2.5 kilometers out of six, and we are uh, out of breath, but doing fine. And we're looking forward to lunch already, right? Get more weight out of our bags. <laughs> we have made it to almost three and a half kilometers, and as you can hear, it's now raining pretty hard. And we are standing under a shelter, just taking a break, as we've been doing all the way up. And there are also toilets at every stop, but I haven't had to use one yet. I guess I'm not drinking that much water, but I uh, hope it stops raining because it's hard to keep everything dry. But it's the forest is blocking a lot of the rain. There's probably like 
20 people just sitting under this hut with us right now from several different countries. I'm really liking my poles right now. They are my best friends, two of my best friends on this, on this trip. <laughs> So we have made it to Leon Leon Hut, which is four kilometers from where we started. And I think it's four kilometers up the mountain as well. As you can hear, it is still raining. We had just finished the most delicious lunch ever, which was basically two hard boiled eggs, one apple, one butter sandwich, one cheese sandwich, and a chicken wing. And it was very good. So and a piece of Toblerone, which I made sure to buy last night. We've got some dark chocolate in us, and it's really, well, it's raised my spirits, but we still have two more kilometers to go before we can unload and prepare the place we're gonna sleep. So hopefully we can make it. I mean, the rain is the rain, we can't change that, but we have a good crew, and people have been very friendly on the trail, so. This is my first real experience hiking in rain like this. It usually, I get lucky, but you know, you always have to press on. So we're gonna do it. Oh my gosh, we have made it to the end of day one. We're gonna have a nice dinner and get out of all of our wet clothing now. And we are at 3,272 3, meters. And basically at 2.30 this morning, it's. 3.15 now, at 2.30 in the morning, we're getting up to hike three more hours up to the top. And hopefully it won't be raining then because it rained most of the day today. It's been raining for the last like four hours, but feeling good. It's all gonna be not downhill from here, but at least easier tonight. And hopefully our stuff will dry out. I'm gonna see if they've got a hair dryer to dry some of the stuff we've got, but um, I mean, one amazing thing about this hike is despite the rain, the rocks on the trail are granite and they are not slippery. Like you can just walk up without a po without poles and nothing is slippery. So it's, uh, that was, that was unbelievable, but totally needed. So I think without that, if, if I was slipping the entire way up, it would have been really demoralizing, but, um, with all the rain, but it wasn't so it's very good. We also have signs here for no public nudity. I don't know what problems they've had in the past, but there's a sign that says no public nudity and no yelling or screaming because this is a holy place. So I'm waiting on my team right now to get back and then, uh, cause I was in the front of our pack and then we will make our way to dinner. Okay, wasn't that a crazy snore? Unbelievable. So we we left all of our big stuff in La Mine Hut for the summit climb. You just take the very, very essential stuff you're going to need. Uh, sunscreen's a must. Sunglasses are a must. All the warm clothes that you have are a must. Uh, water, all of that. But beyond that, don't bring anything else. Definitely bring your, your hiking poles as well. Uh, and we got up at 1 in the morning, and at 2 a.m., we went over to La Badraza Rest House for what they call supper, which is another buffet. Uh, and you're like all, you know, you have a pretty big meal in you, and you're ready to start climbing at about, end up being us, for us about 2.15 in the morning. Ready to rock and roll. <laughs> We're ready to rock and roll. Are we ready for the summit, guys? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, we didn't sleep well because there was this crazy snore, which I recorded, and like you just heard, so hopefully we can make this. It's a clear night. We're hoping for a good view. I'm ready to rock and roll. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go. And we went up, and, and wonderfully, thankfully, it was no longer raining, 
So um, we could see the stars, so we knew that there was a good chance we could have a clear view for sunrise. Uh, and it just felt, you know, in some ways it felt easy for a little while because it wasn't raining. I mean, I felt it was easy. I think that Simone and Marius were exhausted and it was already, it was hard because we were already at 3,200 meters. So you start out at 215 and you're going to go essentially from kilometer six. So we had gone, you know, six kilometers the day before all the way up. And now you're going to go from kilometer six to 8.72 kilometers, which is the peak, Lowe's Peak. 4,095 meters. By the way, I think Lowe's Peak is a really funny name for a very high mountain summit. We started out, and this is where things get hard because you're climbing, like it, it was stairs immediately. And I remember it was like this long section of stairs. And then you kind of get to this, you kind of flatten out for a little bit. And then there's a rope section, which is why the gloves are actually really essential. So the rope section is like not too long it's probably about 800 meters worth of the worth of climbing but you're just like it's this one part in particular I remember it was just exhausting it was because you you know making sure that your your feet are in a safe position and then you're just like pulling yourself up but you're at such a high altitude that you're just tired and it, it was it was tough and I remember Simone especially feeling really she said I can't if there had been any more rope I don't think I could have done it but again dealing with no sleep so but we got through that Andy was really nice to us and Andy really took a, a stronger hand with us the second day the first day he knew it's just like yep climb up but now it, we're encountering things at a higher altitude that are unfamiliar to us and it's not very clear once you get up this high on the trail where to go next there's a big section on the top of the mountain that's like really flat or actually a very small incline going up. And I actually liked that part because I was no longer navigating all these rocks and everything and climbing on a rope. I love that part, but it was a slow, steady incline. And that's probably the last, um, you're pro probably between seven kilometers and eight kilometers. That's what you're dealing with. And it was, it was quite nice. But then we got to the end section, which is about the last 300 meters of the climb. You have to kind of get in this really steep, a pretty steep rock section again to get to the summit. I remember at the end just counting the steps that I had left to what I thought was the summit. You're so tired. You're over 4,000 meters by this point. And you've done all that climb in a day, a day and a half, you know, so it was pretty intense. But we did it. We reached the summit. And let's listen to a clip of that. So we have reached the summit, and man, that was hard. It was a lot of darkness and craggy rocks and climbing up a rope, which was the hardest part, I thought. Um, I've never climbed a rope like that coming up a mountain before, but I guess big mountaineers do it a lot. Um, we made it to a peak called Lowe's Peak, which didn't feel low to us. Um, it's 4,000... 95 meters. Thank you. Thank you, Simone. Um, how are you guys feeling? It's Simone, okay. Right? You're okay? Cold. It's very cold. Yeah. Just sitting here waiting for the sunrise. Yeah. And we're going to go down. I guess that's the thing people do is come up. Oh, and the sun's about to come up. So. Looking forward to breakfast. Very much looking forward to breakfast at that same buffet as last night, which is really good. Hot tea love a hot shower but that's not going to happen <sighs> until tonight um but all in all i would you recommend this to people would you yeah yeah if they're not afraid of fights yeah. it's okay yeah <laughs> i think i would tell people just you know be prepared bring the right stuff but now that we're, we, have, we're, we have to go all the way down but like even with all that rain yesterday we still had a good time yeah except for the snoring guy oh, oh my goodness how many hours of sleep did you guys get last night? One hour. It's shocking. All because of that guy. Ay. We also have people up here waiting with us and they're like doing push-ups on the rocks. And we said, no way. We said, maybe the altitude has gotten to them. You know? <laughs> but all right, we're gonna take some photos. We did it. So proud of you guys. It's really cold. Yeah. After reaching the summit, we stayed and watched the sunrise and took some photos and then started making our way back down to the Labanrata Rest House, 
which so going from 8.72 kilometers back to the six kilometer mark. And then we had breakfast, which was nice. It was a breakfast buffet. Again, so impressed by how much food they're able to have up there and just kudos to the climbers who must bring all that stuff up every day. In fact, you see a lot of people carrying big loads as you're hiking, by the way. And I mean, I'm just in awe that they do that and that they, they, they can get that many things up there. We then picked up the rest of our stuff from La Mine Hut and we're still really happy that it wasn't raining wondering if it was going to again because it is the rainy season in Borneo in December but apparently the weather in Mount Kinabalu is it's never you're never quite sure so you can really hike any time of the year and you you can you know it's a two-day one-night thing you don't know you could get a day of rain you could get two days of rain or or all clear so I wouldn't let the time of year really stop you from climbing it And you're going to now hear a clip of having breakfast, of uh, talking about having breakfast in the La Bon Rata guest house. All right, we've had our breakfast at about 8.30. And we've packed everything up from last night and we're headed down. We've been told it could take about three hours, maybe three and a half, four hours at the most. But we're headed down and uh, we've enjoyed this this uh, guest house that we're standing in front of, or the, the Laban Loata. Oh, I'm just, I'm not getting the name right. <laughs> but it's been a really, really fun time. We feel accomplished, but we will feel most accomplished when we're done. And we get our lunch, which is in three more hours. So let's get going. Okay, so as I explain in this next clip, We finally finished hiking at about 2 p.m. on day two, which if you're following when we started from, which was actually about 2.30, it's almost a 12-hour ordeal from when you leave the La Bonrata Rest House to climb up, come back down, eat breakfast, and then make your way all the way back down. And, um, I mean, this is what I'd mentioned before about the hiking poles on the way down is when you really need them because it's still not that slippery. Most things were still, despite being wet from the day before, it still wasn't slippery, but there were so many stairs down and we all had our moments where we kind of slid a little bit and thought we're gonna (laughs) topple over. And by, I'd say the final three kilometers in particular, you just feel so tired. You, I was literally using my hiking poles as alternative legs, like leaning on them. I think you just hike so, you go so far up so fast and then the same with coming down that you just feel the soreness and it starts to kick in by about noon on the second day. And so we were so happy to be done. And in this next clip, you'll hear us having lunch at the bottom, which would be right before we get our ride back to Kota Kinabalu. So we finally finished guys and we are exhausted. It's just after 2 p.m. We got up and started all this at we got up at 1 a.m. and started hiking at 2.30. So this has been a 12 hour experience today. We hiked 10.7 kilometers, 10.4 kilometers. But uh, I found out that Mario and Simone, my hiking companions, this is the first time they've ever done something like this, like this kind of altitude and this kind of hardcore hiking. So yeah. I'm wondering what they thought. What did you think, Mario, of the whole thing? Um, right now I'm feeling uh, weak and my legs uh, are burning. But the hike was amazing. It was tough, but really amazing. Um, I would do it again sometime. Maybe not this mountain, but another mountain. So we will see. Oh, so yeah, you definitely go hiking yeah. again. Yeah. Stay in a hut or something like yeah. that. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's like go hiking at home in, in Bavaria. But it's like not that high. So I think we're going to go hiking at home or do some more high mountains. I don't know. Yeah. Everything. Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. Have you ever stayed overnight in Bavaria to climb a mountain? Uh, I go once a year with my family to stay in like a mountain cabin and um, we go hiking from there so it's like a weekend kind of thing. And you? Yeah, me too. I was, I was this year for a week. Um, we made a mountain road so 
kind of circle into to several mountains and several peaks and we stayed for one week in um, several hostels or something like that and it was quite fun yeah we just hike every day but yeah. just for part of it. Yeah. yeah every day and every day another um, cabin and another peak so it was it was tough but not cool. yeah. But yeah. not as tough as this. Yeah, not as tough. <laughs> it's it's rare to hike that many hours, even when you do a multi-day yeah. trek even higher. It's, maybe it's higher, you go shorter distances every day. So you get into a routine and it's yeah. nice. So you don't feel completely dead. Except if you do part of it includes two AM leave or like, you know. So. Thank you. Thank you. It was great to hike with you. So thank you for coming along with us on our hike of Mount Kinabalu in Borneo, Sabah, Malaysia. And thank you to Simone and Marius for speaking with me during our climb and making my trip a lot more fun. Also, thanks to Andy, our guide, who was very knowledgeable and we couldn't have done the trip without him. I'm also going to post photos of our hike on theschoolofTravels.com, so feel free. I'll put the link also in my Twitter, so feel free to leave us a comment on Twitter or Instagram or, and have a look at the photos. And I hope you enjoyed this solo episode once again, and I look forward to having you along on our next episode. Have a great week. Thanks for listening to the School of Travels podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, we'd love for you to subscribe and leave us a rating wherever you get your podcasts. Special thanks to The Sam Chase for allowing us to use their song, In a Perfect World. Don't forget to join us next week for another episode, and remember to always let travel be your teacher. If you keep your options open, there are places you will go. They will treat you like the kings and queens your parents thought you'd be when you were born. You'd see it all with your head up standing tall, and you'd look back and think it's funny how you spent your time and money.